Thank you. Uh, so this work, um, as Nader said, we are, I'm going to speak about the detection of reflected light from uh, extrasolar planets. I just want to say that uh, uh, most of the work was done by the PhD student Jorge Martinez. He's now in ESO uh, in Chile in the context of uh, collaboration, so he could not be present. So I'm, I'm giving the talk for him. So uh, the first question we can ask is why do we want to detect the reflected light spectrum of a, of a planet? Well, first, because it basically represents a direct detection of a planet. So it's another evidence that the planet is there, and that's, that's important. And, and also, it's uh, some sort of, so when I talk about reflected spectrum, I'm basically talking about optical reflected spectrum. And it can be seen as sort of a complementary to infrared uh, observations where you try, can try to see the emitted uh, spectrum. Now, secondly, because uh, detecting the reflected light also allows us to probe the, the planetary atmosphere, uh, derive, for instance, or try to derive the planetary uh, geometric albedo, uh, some atmosphere physics like winds and other, and other things. Uh, then, uh, if you detect the reflected spectrum of the planet, you may be actually able to detect the velocity of the planet. And if you know the velocity of the planet, you can derive dynamically its mass. So, for instance, if you don't know the orbital inclination, this is what happens when you find a planet using radio velocities. Uh, getting the reflected light spectrum allows you basically to transform your system into a, a binary system where you know the velocities of the two bodies. And so you can actually derive the dynamical mass for the planet. And finally, there are other things you can do. For instance, it has been proposed that we can uh, try to derive the planet's rotation rate from these sorts of observations. Now, the problem of these uh, sort of measurements is that they are uh, extremely hard. Uh, first, uh, well, reflected light uh, from exosolar planets was actually only recently possible with the advance of Corot and Kepler uh, satellites. And uh, the, 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 the problem, uh, so even in broadband, so uh, the problem is that, for instance, if you have a giant planet in a three-day period orbit, so let's say favorable case, uh, so because the reflected light depends on the distance to the star, and with a geometric albedo of 0 0.3, you basically expect a flux uh, ratio, planet to star flux ratio of the order of 10 to the minus 5, which is uh, a very tiny uh, value and difficult to detect. So uh, there's also some possible uh, other additional problems. For instance, it has been reported that the albedos for uh, hot Jupiters may be lower than we would like to, uh, although some higher values have also been reported in, in the literature. Now, what we propose basically is to use what we call, let's say, the power of the cross-correlation function. So here in this chunk, uh, in this uh, image, I show you a chunk of uh, spectrum. This is a spectrum of Alpha Sand B, but it doesn't matter. It's a solar type star. Uh, in, and just in this 15 angstrom region, you see there are lots of spectral lines. Now, what you can try to do is to use together all the information of the spectral lines. And to do that, what you can do is to use uh, the cross correlation function. Now, the cross-correlation function is something that has been widely used to derive radio velocities with high precision. For example, HARPS. This is the method that HARPS uses to gather the information from the spectrum and derive the radio velocities. But basically, in one word, the cross-correlation function is basically the cross-correlation of your spectrum with a template. The template can be a stellar spectrum of reference, but it can also be a binary mask. And uh, that this is actually what we use in the case of HARPS. But roughly speaking, when you do this sort of uh, cross-correlation of a spectrum with a binary mask, what you uh, recover is basically this. So this is a typical cross-correlation function of a solar type star. Now we are no longer in the wavelength domain, but in the velocity domain. So this minimum here gives you basically, so the position of this cross-correlation gives you basically the radio velocity of your system. Uh, but more important, uh, what you are doing when you are cross-correlating your spectrum with a mask it's basically, it's like if you were stacking all the lines and using all the lines at the same time to get information about your, your spectrum. And so basically the cross correlation can be seen as a, some sort of an average spectral line. And so it has, since it's a stacked spectral line, it has a very high signal to noise. So just to give you uh, one, one example, so as I said, it, when you do the cross-correlation, you stack all the lines. 
And uh, in a good approximation, you can say that the signal to noise in your CCF is basically the signal to noise in your spectrum multiplied by the square root of the lines you use to do the cross correlation. So, for instance, if you have a spectrum with a signal to noise of 1000, which is a fairly value to, to have, uh, then if you have 3600 3, lines, this is the typical lines used uh, for harps, uh, you get a signal to noise on the CCF of 60,000, which is a very nice value. And so, uh, we, what you can try to do is, using this method, increase the signal to noise of your, let's say, spectrum or of your cross correlation and try to detect the reflected light. So, in principle, what you can do or what you can try to do is, so you take a spectrum of a star or a bunch of spectra in practice, you calculate the cross correlation function. Uh, if you have a planet, then what you will observe is the, the spectrum or the cross correlation function of the star plus the cross correlation uh, function of the planet. And the, the flux of the planet is given basically by the flux of the star because it's reflected light from the, from the, from the stellar reflected light on the planet times the geometric albedo times a factor that depends on the radius of the planet and the semi-major axis of the orbit squared. And so, uh, if you have the, the spectrum that contains the spectrum of the star plus the reflected spectrum on the star of, on the planet, what you'll get is basically this. So your cross correlation function should be the, the let's say the, the the Gaussian of your of your star plus a tiny. This is exaggerated here. The tiny Gaussian of your uh, planet. So let's see. Can we do this? So. To try to convince our, our, ourselves that this would be uh, possible to do, what we started to do was uh, to test this concept with real data, but not real data in the sense that we, we could detect this signal, but doing simulations with real data. So basically, we started by uh, using high signal to noise ARP spectra. We computed the cross correlation function for each spectrum. Uh, then we added another spectrum or another cross correlation function. Actually, you can work in either domains, uh, and uh, to simulate the planetary signal, and we varied its velocity to simulate the orbital motion of the planet around the, the center of mass of the star planet system. Then we subtracted using a different spectrum, we subtracted the stellar template, so basically if you want to detect the tiny signal of the planet, you, would, you need to get rid of the stellar spectrum, and so you need to create a template where that you, let's say, subtract uh, the, to, on your data to be able to, in the end, only have the tiny cross-correlation function of, of the planet. And we can do this, of course, for different sorts of planets, different radius, albedos, orbital distances. We did a bunch of simulations. These were published in, in a paper by, by Jorge and Martins. And uh, basically, the sort of signal that you can detect, so this is a simulation done for a Jovian-like planet in a two-day period orbit. And assuming that you are able to get a signal to noise of 1,600 after a 15 minute exposure. This is just a toy model just to show you how, how it works. So if everything goes well in the ideal world, what you'll get is uh, basically in this plot, what you get, this is the rate of velocity. So each line here is one cross correlation function. And basically this is time going up here. So the orbital phase or time. And so what you should ob obtain here is basically uh, that you get, this is the signal of the planet <coughs> Excuse me. The, uh, the, the, the cross correlation function of the planet, the signal of the planet as a function of the orbital phase. Here you don't see anything because you have sort of new planet. The planet is close to transiting, let's say. And, and so the phase of the planet is very small and so you don't detect the signal. But when the planet is close to full planet, you do detect in this simulation very well the signal. Of course, you can do even better because you can, you know, uh, put all these cross correlation functions in the, uh, in, the, in the reference velocity of the planet and so stack all of them together and if you do that, uh, I just wanted, yeah, I'll, I'll go back to that. Uh, so if you do that, this is what you get and when you combine all these things, this is the final cross correlation function. So you have here a very, very clear detection. But okay, this is a very favorable case um, and uh, what, 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 I mean, what can we do in reality may be a bit more, more complicated, of course. I just want to come back to this slide to say that actually the, this amplitude of the signal here will give you actually the mass of your planet. And so this allows you to detect a dynamical mass 
for your planet. So anyway, we were encouraged by this simulation, so we decided to try this with 51 PAG. So 51 PAG B was the first planet discovered 20 years ago, and uh, it, it has many advantages because it's a very bright star, I think 5.5 magnitude, and uh, the planet is a hot Jupiter, so it's uh, one of the most favorable cases to detect. And so we decided to, to ask for uh, ESO time. We got the time. Uh, this plot shows you the radio velocity of the star, not of the planet, as a function of orbital phase. The points are our uh, measurements. This is basically to show you when we, did, we, we obtained our measurements. So we obtained them close to opposition, most of them. Uh, the stars here are actually the measurements that we ended up using to, to try to retrieve the signal. Um, the other ones, they, they were not used for different reasons. I, I can explain it later, but they were a priori excluded uh, due to some physical arguments. Um, and uh, so these are the measurements we got. And then we did all the processing, all the stacking of the CCFs and so on. And this is what we got. So here I have, I, I'm showing you, this is the cross-correlation function of the planet, and this tells us that we were able to uh, positively retrieve the signal of the reflected light spectrum of 51 peg on its uh, tiny, tiny, I mean, giant um, uh, hot Jupiter. So here I show you the, the parameters that we retrieved. This is, let's say, the contrast of this function, or the amplitude of the Gaussian here, uh, significance of the detection and the full width of maximum. This is for the star, this is for the planet, and uh, what I want to say here is basically that, uh, so we detected the signal with a contrast of six times uh, 10 to the minus five. Uh, the orbital inclination that were, and the mass of the planet that were derived uh, with, with these measurements were roughly 80 degrees, which corresponds to a mass of uh, 0 0.47 Jupiter masses, so it confirms that it's uh, indeed a planet, uh, and uh, it also confirms the previous results of Broggy et al, who detected the infrared, uh, a tentative infrared uh, um, emitted uh, light spectrum from, from 51 PEG, uh, I think, last year. We also could uh, try to do some, uh, uh, infer some uh, planetary properties from, from, this, uh, from this detection. Uh, I, I can tell you that uh, the detection is uh, three sigma, roughly, and, and so I would not bet uh, too much on the details of the final parameters we obtain, but still we can try to do some, some physics. And basically, we, we, our measurements suggest that uh, 51 peg B can be, or, or is likely an inflated uh, I albedo planet. Uh, actually, the data can be explained if the radius is, uh, with a radius of 1.9 Jupiter radius, uh, if we assume an albedo of 0 0.5, which values are a bit high, but uh, there are some examples in the literature of uh, planets of similar, with similar properties, so we are not too uncomfortable uh, with this. And uh, one thing that is still, uh, let's say, bothering us is that uh, CCF of the planet is uh, actually quite broadened, and uh, this can explain, be explained by strong winds, maybe, uh, fast rotation, maybe, or just maybe noise in the data. And so, I, I, again, I would say this, I think we have a clear detection, but the parameters of the final CCF are not uh, extremely um, known very accurately. Uh, so, just, just to finish, uh, I would like to say that we have been doing some estimates for the future. Uh, this, so, uh, assuming different sorts of albedos and different sorts of planets, we, we try to understand what is the signal to noise we need to obtain if we want to detect uh, the planets, uh, these sort of signals in the planets at two sigma. And uh, for instance, if you want to detect an exoplanet uh, that is like uh, Venus in terms of albedo, but it's an Earth radius in a one-day period orbit, you need uh, 10,000 signal to noise. Uh, this seems uh, very, very much difficult, but remember that the ELT will come. And the VLT, if you just extrapolate from, from the UVS spectrograph on the VLT, you get that uh, for a G2V star of magnitude 7, in 15 minutes exposure, you get 5,000 signal to noise already. So I think that uh, with the ELT, we'll have really a lot of work to do in this, uh, in this domain. Uh, and so the conclusions and take-home messages, so we detected the reflected light spectrum of... Uh, um, of 51 peg B, and this was done with present day instruments on a small telescope, 3.6 meter telescope, uh, though with a very, very uh, stable spectrograph. 
Um, and uh, we find evidence that 51 PEG-B may be an inflated out Jupiter with high albedo, and uh, there are great perspectives for, uh, for the future, for the high risk, but also for espresso at, uh, at the VLT. And just before I finish, I just want to say that 51 PEG is much more than a planet. So probably you know this is the concert by a band that is called 51 PEG. And uh, this is actually an industrial rock band. I don't, I'm not particularly fond of this sort of music. But if you, well, this is, was already in the past. But anyway, I'm sure they are still giving concerts. So a uh, good opportunity to, be, to see a planet live. And thank you.